Hello everyone, my name is Ebenezer Teigaga and I'm the lecturer for Electronics 1, which is a second semester level 100 course, which means that in, in level 200 first semester you continue to do Electronics 2. So in Electronics 1, we are actually giving you the basics of electronics and then we'll introduce you into some advanced electronics. Um, since we don't have much time, I'm going to go straight to the point. First of all, you cannot talk about electronics without considering electricity, uh, in which the basic phenomena is the flow of electrons which results in electric current. Without electric current, there will be no electricity. Without electricity, there will be no electronics. So in order for us to look at uh, electric current, we also have to look at the electron, which is responsible for electric current. When we have flow of electrons, we have electric current. And we cannot talk about the electron without looking at the atom. So to start with, we'll be looking at the structure of the atom. I believe we are all familiar with the atom. Um, we've learned in secondary school. And the atom usually has the core, which is the nucleus. And it, is, it has various shells around it. In the nucleus, we have two major um, particles. We have the protons and then we also have the neutrons. The protons are positively charged. The neutrons don't have any charge. They are neutral. Hence the name neutron. They are neutral. They don't have any charge. And then the electrons are negatively charged. So since the protons are positively charged and the neutrons don't have a charge, it makes the whole nucleus also positively charged. So since the nucleus is positively charged and then the electrons are negatively charged, it means that it's always a force of attraction between the nucleus and the electron. But then as you can see, though there's a force of attraction between the nucleus and the electrons, we are not seeing the electrons on the surface of the nucleus. They are a distance apart from the nucleus. And then what is actually responsible for that is the fact that these electrons also possess energy with which they move around the nucleus. And the kind of energy they have and the speed at which they move prevents them from being attracted onto the surface of the nucleus. So it's just like the way, it's just like an aeroplane flying. Once the once the aeroplane takes off and is able to maintain a particular speed, it will be difficult for it to get to the ground. So long as that speed is maintained and the aeroplane will keep the aeroplane will keep moving until it stops. The, it cannot be it cannot be um, forced down by the uh, force of gravity. So in the same way, because of the energy that the electrons possess and they are able to move at a, uh, uh, move around the uh, nucleus at a particular speed, they cannot be uh, um, attracted onto the surface. But one thing you observe is that um, some of the some of the uh, electrons are particular are closer though all of them are a distance apart from the nucleus um, some of them are closer than others if you see these two electrons are closer to the nucleus than these two so that tells you that the energy they possess are different now these two have been able, they have been attracted by the nucleus to a particular distance, which is uh, closer as compared to these two. Which means that these ones, the energy they possess is not high enough to keep them further apart from the nucleus. So um, they have been attracted closer to the nucleus as compared to this. So we can also say that the energy that these uh, electrons here possess, the ones that are closer to the nucleus possess, are much lower as compared to the ones further away because if there's a force of attraction from the nucleus towards the electrons and these two have been able to keep themselves further away from the nucleus it means that the energy they possess is greater but these ones are weaker as compared to this so they have been drawn much closer to the to the how do you call it to the nucleus now i'm saying this because uh, it is very important to understand the, the energy that this possess, that there is difference in the energy. Because the shell, in this uh, orbit that you see, this ring around the nucleus that you see, <coughs> which is the orbit uh, of the electrons, is also known as the shell. Now, 
every electron in the same shell possesses the same level of energy, mm, uh, possesses the same uh, amount of energy. So this and this possess the same amount of energy, and this also possesses the same amount of energy. But energy, uh, energy level between this and that differ. This one has lower energy, and this one has higher energy. So it means that the shell of the atom can also represent an energy level. So apart from considering the fact that the electrons possess energy, the, en the shell of the atom can also represent a particular energy level. So if you are talking now in terms of shells, you can say that <clears throat> the energy level of the shell here, which is closer to the nucleus, is different from the energy level of this shell, which is farther away from the nucleus. And the energy level of this shell is lower than the energy level in this shell. That is why you'll be told in your chemistry that for an atom to move from a lower shell to a higher shell, it will have to gain more energy. And for an a electron to move from a, a higher shell to a lower shell, it needs to give off energy because the energy levels vary. So the shells of the atom can also represent various energy levels. Now, in every material, we don't have only one atom. We have several atoms. And uh, these atoms form bonds and then together form the material. Just like the way in the human body, we have several cells coming together to form the whole uh, body from tissue, organ, and then it, co it continues that way. Atoms also come together to form the material. So they form bonds. And usually, it is the atomous shells, the electrons in the atomous shells that are used to form the bonds. So usually, when we are talking about bonds, we actually don't consider the, uh, the electrons in the innermost, inner, inner shells, only the atomous or the valence shells uh, that are considered. And the electrons in the valence or atomous shells are the ones that are responsible for the formation of bonds. So, in any material, we have several atoms, uh, billions of atoms coming together to form the material. And then, so which means that the shells, the atomous shells, in the electrons in the atomous cells come together to form the bond. So we have several shells coming together in the material in which bonds are formed. So if this shell represents an energy level, it means that in the formation of bonds, we have several energy levels coming together in the forms of bonds. So when we have more than, uh, more than one bond uh, formed, um, which means that this energy level combined with another energy level in which a bond is formed, and another one formed now since we have several energy levels coming together we don't have, we don't call it an energy level again we call it energy band mm, we call it energy band or a band of energy so several uh, energy levels come together to give you an energy band now this is important because it helps us to differentiate different materials in terms of their electrical conductivity so we can now that we are when you're talking about band it means that we are talking about various shells energy levels coming together to, to, in, in which bonds are formed in the material so we now talk call call them in, uh, energy bands so let's look at how we can relate this to uh, the three major types of materials that we have we have um we have insulators we have conductors and we also have semiconductors so let's see how this goes into them but before then, um, of course, in your basic chemistry, you've learned that um, there are several, several shells of the atom based on the atomic number. And then there's a specific number of electrons that each cell can contain. And if you want to usually calculate, you can use this formula, 2n squared, where n is the number of the shell. So if you want to know the number of shell that um, the, the, uh, the number, of, sorry, if you want to know that... Um, the number of uh, electrons that a particular shell can contain. For example, you want to know the number of electrons that this uh, this the first shell, uh, second shell can contain. The, this is the second shell, so n is two. So two squared is four. Four times uh, two is eight. So if you look here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can do the same for all. I mean, this and I know most of us already know. So we'll move on. And then okay. So like I was explaining very uh, earlier on. The, the various shells of the atom can also represent various energy levels. So now let's move on to the materials. Okay, so I told you that once we have bonds formed, now we are not looking at a single uh, atom, but several atoms coming together to form a material. 
then we don't talk about uh, energy level we talk about energy bands and then this can be grouped into the valence band the band gap or sometimes called the forbidden gap forbidden uh, band and they also have the conducting band now the valence band is the normal uh, energy band that is formed as a result of the normal bonding and then we also have the conduction band in the condition band, once we are talking about condition band, we are talking about the motion of electrons, which are usually, um, which which usually break off from the bonds. In materials, there are certain materials that, even though the atoms are formed bond to form the material, uh, based on the energy that the those uh, electrons uh, gain, they can gain external energy. They are able to break off from the bonds and they become free in the material. And those are the electrons that are responsible for electrical conduction. So, uh, in such in such band, we call it the conduction band. Any electron that is found in that band is the one that is uh, is responsible for electrical conduction. Now, so when the electrons have not received any extra energy in order to break off from the bonding, the band that is formed is what we call the valence band, because all the bonds that are formed the uh, energy levels that come together from the various bond in which the various bonds are formed those are the, those are comes from the valence um, uh, valence shells so the band of the band that the band uh, the energy band that uh, comes as a result of that is found within the valence band mm -hmm. and for electron an electron to move from the valence band into the conduction band it needs to overcome what we call the band gap, which means that the energy that is being supplied or is being received by the electron should be such that it can it can move it can uh, jump from here to here. So and there's another way we can look at it based on this uh, diagram here. So here it, it actually shows the difference. Uh, this one is a general representation, but now here we look at it in terms of the various materials that we have. And as you can see here, this is the band gap or the or the forbidden gap. So, and this tells you that for for an electron to be able to move from the this uh, valence band into the conduction band, it needs an energy which is greater than this. That is a uh, 300 kilojoule per mole. It needs to be able to be greater than that, or it should be, it should be greater than this, but less than 400 um, nm. So once an electron is able to gain energy greater than this, it will find itself in the conduction band. And here we have, sorry, sorry, I think, um, sorry, the energy is supposed to be less than less than uh, 300 kilojoule per mole, uh, but it should be greater than 400 nm. Here, uh, for uh, for an electron to be able to move from this valence band into the conduction band. It needs an energy that is greater than 300 kilojoule, but less than 400 uh, uh, newton meter. Okay, so um, so sorry about here. It's supposed to be uh, the energy is supposed to be less than 300 kilojoule per mole, and here the energy is supposed to be greater than 300 kilojoule per mole. So once an electron has this level of energy, it can move from the valence band to the conduction band. And then here, here, but you can see the energy required here is much greater than the energy that is required here. But here, you can see they did not actually put any energy because you can see that there is an overlap between the, uh, the uh, valence band and then the conduction band, which means that already some electrons that are forming the bonds in the valence bands are already in the conduction band, so they are already available for conduction. So with this, you don't need an extra energy for them. These materials are called conductors. They are readily available for conduction. Already, they have free uh, electrons in them to aid in electrical conduction. But in a semiconductor, well, semiconductors, uh, um, their electrical properties lie between that of the conductors and then um, insulators. Insulators are very, very poor conductors. As you can see, the reason why they are poor is because for you to have any electron moving from the how do you call it? The valence band conduction band. You need a huge amount of energy to do that. Uh, but as you can see, I said you need a huge amount of energy in order to do that. Doesn't mean that it's not possible. Uh, there's nothing like a perfect insulator. Every insulator has a breakdown point. 
at which it will now begin to conduct. So you may you may use a particular slippers to work in a 240 volts environment. But if you use the same slippers to work in 11,000 volts, you may be in trouble. Because that slippers is not able to withstand um, uh, the current driven by uh, two, 240 volts. We will not be able to withstand the current driven by 11,000 volts because the voltage is actually the force that drives electrons through a conductor. So just like the way I may, I may throw, uh, let's say, I may throw um, a bag, a bag containing a mobile phone to you. I may throw it softly to you, um, and then you catch it. Though it's, the mobile phone is heavier, I can throw it to you uh, comfortably, and then you catch it. But I could take a pen, a marker, which is lighter than the phone. But the, the energy with which I will use to throw it will cause a huge damage to you. So, which means that though the phone is heavier than the, the marker, because the energy I use to throw the phone to you is so small, you can confidently catch it even and then smile with it. But by the time I raise, I raise my hand and you see that I'm going to use a, a greater force to throw the marker to you, you try to uh, block it because it could cause a, a bigger damage. The same thing applies to electricity. When the voltage is very high, it can drive the electrons uh, very far and then easily through any obstacle. So when you are using an insulator, it's not every insulator that I can use in every environment. Every insulator is designed to withstand a particular level of voltage. So that is very, very important. So that also helps to explain what is going on here. The reason why it is uh, insulators are poor conductors is because for you to cause them to conduct, you need to give those the electrons in the valence band a huge amount of energy to in order to overcome the band gap or the forbidden band in order to arrive here for conduction. Okay, so we we'll move on from there. So that is that for the energy bands. Now we'll, go, we'll move on to semiconductors. And in fact, when I talk about electronics, semiconductors are the backbone of electronic electronics. Without semiconductors, there will be nothing like electronics. So this is a very, very important topic. And then I, what we've done so far is just to usher you into this topic. Now that you've understood some of the things that we're speaking about, I mean, going forward, I don't think you should have any problem. So, like I said earlier, on, uh, semiconductors, their electrical properties lie between that of the a conductor and then uh, 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 an insulator, which means that they are partial, you could consider them as partial conductors, uh, but they are not usually partial conductors naturally. Naturally, uh, semiconductors are insulators. Mm, they are insulators, they don't conduct at all. But the reason why they are very important is that it is easy for you to manipulate them, to make them uh, become partially conductive or even fully conductive. And that's what we will be looking at. So here we have, we have, um, we have the most popular um, semiconductor material, which is silicon. Silicon is a very popular, is the most popular. Another one is uh, germanium, but silicon is m m more popular. And silicon, as you can see, this is a silicon material, and these are silicon atoms coming together to form uh, the silicon material. The silicon has a, a silicon atom has four has four uh, valence electrons. It has four valence electrons or four electrons in the atomal shape. So usually when bonds are forming, each atom will form bonds with four neighboring atoms because it has four electrons to use for the bonding. So this, let's use the middle one. This one will use one, electro, uh, one electron to form bond with this one, another one to form bond with this one, another one to form a bond with this one, another one to form the, a bond with this one. And similar to this and this, they also do the same thing. Um, but since we cannot draw everything, this is just for illustration uh, purpose, purposes. Okay, so what is so important about this silicon or this semiconductor material? What is so important about it? First of all, let's look at um, partial conduction in the semiconductor. Now, here we have not done anything to the semiconductor, but just by virtue of the fact that heat gets to the material, some things can happen. And let's see what will happen. What we call partial conduction in the semiconductor. So here again, 
Uh, as you can see, this is actually a silicon material. Now, let's say that heat is applied to one of the atoms here. So the electrons in the bonds that have been formed also gain heat energy. And by so doing, they can use that energy to break off from the bond. Now, when it breaks off, the atom that breaks off creates a hole or a vacant position, a position where it lives. So what is happening? Now, this atom that has broken up because it has gained heat energy or thermal energy is free within the material. So once it is free within the material, any, any, any external voltage that is applied to it can cause the material to become conductive. This electron is now going to be responsible for electrical conduction in the material. So though the silicon naturally is an insulator, by virtue of this uh, receiving thermal energy, it, it begins what we call partial conduction. But there is more. Now, you realize that the electron that broke off from the bond created a hole or a, a, a vacant uh, position here. Meanwhile, some other electrons may have broken off, off from the bonds. So what happens is that anytime the electron breaks off, it makes that atom unstable. And for the atom to be stable, it has to have all the, the uh, valence electrons uh, that is using to form the bonds available in the bonds. Once uh, an electron breaks off, it becomes unstable. So that atom begins to yearn or desire for electron, begin to try to pull electron to fill that space, that vacant position. So what happens is that some of the electrons that have moved away will come and fill. But the, the thing is that those electrons that broke off also have created space where they left. So at the end of the day, we have one electron moving from one place to fill the hole, and whatever they leave also creates the hole. And that continues happening. So while we have electrons moving from one place to another, we also have holes being created in the rivers. But the electrons that are able to move a uh, break off, they are the ones that aid in uh, partial conduction. So the movement of the electrons in the material as a result of this aids in what we call the partial conduction of the semiconductor. Now, with this, it means that the, uh, the semiconductor or the silicon material is becoming, has become a conductor, partially. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that you don't have control. You may not. You, is, you don't have control about this energy that uh, the material is receiving. So, is there a way that we can artificially create free electrons, free electrons within the material, so that we know that once we have free electrons in the material, it, now, it has not become a, a conductor? Can we? Yes, we can. So that brings us to what we call doping. So in doping, what we do is that we introduce an atom, a different atom, or an atom from a different uh, uh, substance mm, uh, or different element into the semiconductor material and to create a little of a, a, a sort of a, a instability within the whole material. But how does this happen? Now, the idea, the whole idea here is to create free electrons within the material. Because you know, once we have free electrons within the material, those electrons will be responsible for electrical conduction, and that makes the material now become conductive. So, what do we do? We are still using the silicon material. Now, we have phosphorus, we have boron. As you can see, boron has three valence electrons, and phosphorus has five. And this is silicon, which has four. So, here, for the first step, we have the silicon material, and then we introduce just a single atom of phosphorus into it. What happens? Now, you, can, you realize that the, um, the phosphorus has five valence electrons. So once you bring it here, and all the silicon atoms only form bonds with five, four neighboring atoms, silicon atoms. So, which means that when you introduce the phosphorus here, it can form bond with this, that, this, and that. After using the four valence electrons to form bonds, it has an extra one which does not have any place to form a bond. And that, the, that uh, electron now becomes free within the material. So if we have more than one phosphorus atom inside, each of them will donate or produce free uh, electron within the material. And once we have free electrons in the material, it has become conductive. So this is an artificial way of uh, making the semiconductor 
a, condu a, a conductive. Now, on the other on the other hand, if instead of using phosphorus, we use boron, which has three uh, valence electrons. In this case, once you introduce a boron here, since it has only three valence electrons, it will form bond with one. It will form form bond with this. It will form, will form bond with this. Then it has exhausted the three valence electrons. It doesn't have any electron to form bond with this one. So what happens? A hole is created here. Once the hole is created here, it brings stability. So now electrons will be forced to break off from their bonds in order to fill here. But you realize that once they break off, wherever they break off, they also create a hole there. So in this case, by, by introducing the boron, which, is, uh, which has uh, three valence electrons, we are creating hole within the material. Here we create free electrons, here we create free holes. Each of these makes the material conductive. So here the electrons are the majority charge carriers, and here the holes are the majority charge carriers. And this process is what we call doping. The process of introducing uh, an impure, an impurity element into the semiconductor material to make it conductive is what we call doping. Now we are calling it impurity because if you have a bag of rice and then you put a grain of uh, a, a grain of maize inside, since that grain of maize uh, is not rice. It renders it renders that that um, sack of rice impure. Wherever you sell, if somebody see the grains of uh, uh, maize inside, they will not accept it because they wanted to buy rice. So the grain of maize has become an impurity in the rice. The same way, if you have a bag of maize and then you have grains of small small grains of rice inside, the the small grains of rice, small small grains of rice inside become impurity in the maize because it is a sack of maize. You are not supposed to find rice inside. The same way, since this is a silicon material and you have introduced a foreign material, a foreign atom inside, this one becomes an impure, impure atom in the material. That's why you can say that. So the doping is a process of introducing an impurity element or atom into the semiconductor material to either make it. Uh, produce free electrons or free holes. Whichever way we make the uh, semiconductor become conductive. Okay, so this is another way of representing it. Here, instead of using phosphorus, they use antimony. Antimony also has one, two, three, four, five valence electrons. So it, it can it can it can produce the same effect as the phosphorus. So when it forms a bond, it will have one extra element. Uh, electron which is not forming a bond, it will be free within the material to aid in conduction. And then, um, okay, here again we have the boron which creates the hole. So um, now we have been able to uh, cause our semiconductor to become conductive. So what is all this? What? what why putting? Why doing? Or going through all this struggle to make it conductive? What do you want to achieve? What is the essence in all this? Are we just playing with the material? Okay. So that brings us to what we call the PN junction. And the PN junction is actually also very, very important uh, in the electronics. In fact, in the, when, you, in, in, when you're talking about electrical components, the PN junction is actually what we call the, P, uh, the diode. Anyway, we'll get there. So PN junction, now we, we, look, we look at doping, where we form um, <coughs> uh, a free holes in the material create free holes in the material free holes now first of all before we move on let me let me say this when you are able to when you dope a material mm, such that it has free electrons like this mm, where you have free electrons the material that is formed is known to be an n type material n type material and for negative which means that the electrons that are produced since they are neg they are negative charge they call it n type material and then when you dope when you dope the material such that it has holes then it's called a pita material the reason i call pita material is that the holes are considered to have a charge uh, opposite to that of uh, of the electron so if the electron is negative charge then the holes is positive hence p for positive pita material so when it, when a semiconductor material is doped such that it has free holes inside it is called a p type material now 
When you now join an entire material to a Peter material, you form what you call a PN junction. Um, let me see if there's another diagram. Okay, mm, okay, good. So maybe, just maybe, I might use this one to explain. Um, okay, good. I can let me use this one to explain. Um, okay, 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 okay. Okay, let me use this one and I'll, I'll continue with this one. Now, when you follow a PN junction, what you are doing is that you are bringing a PETA material and joining it to a, a, an enter material and forms a PN junction. This is a physical joining. Eh? Physical joining. It's like you have you have a sliced bread and then you you put two sliced bread together. You just join them physically. So here, PETA material, enter material join together to form PN junction. Here, He's, this is where we have the joint, and that's where they, we call the junction. Mm, the junction it is a physical junction. But then, um, what happens when you do this? You have a Peter material here. Uh, we have holes eh, as majority charge carriers, or you can say it's, high, it's more positive. And here we have electrons as majority charge carriers, or you can say it's more negative. But something happens around the junction. The physical junction that you have created you have joined them together that joint here something happens around it what happens let me explain if you have two rooms with a partition a, a wall between them here we can say that the junction here is the wall so these are the two rooms now okay you take your eyes off this for the moment let's say you have two rooms with a, a partition a wall partition between the two of them and one room is a cold store and another room is a boiler room or a furnace where it's very very hot or let's say a boiler room very very hot another room is a cold room a cold store very very cold now you realize that though in the cold store is very it very is very cold and in the boiler room is very hot at the barrier and the the partition between the partition the wall of partition between the two of them around that partition will not be as cold as a as a cold uh, cold store and it will also not be as hot as the boiler room. Why? Because it is it is it is it is a barrier between the cold room and the hot room. So around it, you are going to have a mixture of hot and cold atmosphere uh, uh, air. So there's going to be a mixture of hot and cold air around the the how do you call it the the barrier the the uh, wall of, wall of partition. Now. The wall of partition is a physical wall that you can see. So here, you can see that the, the junction is a physical junction. Just like the entire material is a physical material, P-type is also a physical material. Here, where the room, the cold room is physical, the boiler room is physical, and the wall of partition between them is also physical. But you realize that the mixture of hot and uh, cold air around the junction cannot be seen. Those are, you cannot see it with your physical eyes, but it is there. The same way, in this place, since here we have more holes which are positively charged, and here we have more electrons which are negatively charged, around the junction here, some electrons will try to move from the end region and cross the barrier in order to fill the holes in the, in the P region. The same way, some holes will move from the P region here in attempt to collect electrons from the end region. By so doing, there's going to be a mixture of of electrons and holes around this physical junction here there's going to be a mixture of uh, electrons and holes what we call electron hole pairs there are going to be electron hole pairs around the 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 the, the, the junction pn junction but so by so doing we are going to have a particular layer created just like the way in the cold room and then uh, the boiler room um, there's a uh, there's a mixture of hot and cold air around the junction here too. We are going to have electron hole pairs around the uh, the junction here. But though the junction is physical, this one uh, the mixture of uh, electrons and hole or the electron hole pairs is not physical. You cannot see it with your physical eyes, but it is there. So that is what forms what we call the depletion layer. So the mixture of electrons and air or electron hole pairs around the junction forms what we call a depletion layer. And that creates a potential uh, difference of about, let's say, 0 0.7 or 0 0.6 for silicon materials. 
and then around 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 volts for germanium uh, semiconductor material so um so that is the difference between the depletion layer and the, the junction the junction is physical but the depletion layer is not physical just like the way in a cold room the uh, wall of partition is physical but the mixture of hot and cold air around it is not physical the same way the depletion layer is not physical it's a field around the pn junction and it actually has a voltage uh, a potential uh, voltage of about 0.7 for silicon and then 0.3 for germanium so which means that in order for this thing to actually conduct you need to overcome this barrier first before it can conduct and that brings us to the next step where we can talk about forward bias or reverse bias so here as you can see we have a different illustration here we have the p type here p um, type material n type material here and then we have the uh, pn junction and then we have the depletion layer mm -hmm. i can see we have the electron hole pair here now assuming we connect an external voltage source such that we apply the positive terminal to the p type material and we apply the negative terminal to the n type material what happens since the p type material is more positively charged it has holes which are positively charged <clears throat> and the terminal of the how do you call it the terminal of the uh, voltage source or the voltage source it will connect the positive to positive it means that like like poles repel unlike poles attract so the positive terminal here is going to repel the holes within this material towards here the same way since the negative terminal is connected to the entire material where we have electrons which are negatively charged the negative terminal is going to repel the electrons away from the end region towards here but i realize that whilst the positive uh, terminal is repairing the holes the negative it is attracting the holes so that will force the holes to move across the region uh, the barrier here towards this piece the same way since the uh, negative terminal is repairing the uh, uh, when the negative terminal is repair, repairing the electrons at the same time the positive terminal is attracting them so at the end of the day we have holes crossing the barrier and electrons also crossing the barrier by so doing, it's going to break down the depletion layer. The layer that was formed, which has a mixture of hot and cold air, will be broken down. And then conduction will take place. Once we have electrons flowing, we have electrical conduction. By so doing, we cause the PN junction to conduct. This process is known as, when this happens, we say that the PN junction is forward biased. On the other hand, if we interchange the terminals of we interchange the terminals of the external voltage source, like you see in the next slide, where this time we put the negative terminal to the P type and positive terminal to the N type, the negative terminal is going to attract the holes, is going to attract the holes towards it, while the positive terminal attracts the electrons towards it. When this happens, now the depletion layer rather widens. Under this condition, the semiconductor, the PN junction, does not conduct, and is is termed to be reverse biased. The semiconductor, the PN junction, is said to be reverse biased. Okay, I believe I believe we are getting somewhere. So this is a, a grass, the IV uh, curve to show you um, what happens when you forward bias and reverse bias. Now, as you can see. This is reverse by this forward bias. When you are forward biasing, this is a voltage, this is a current. When you are forward biasing, as you move from here, you don't sh see any sharp rise in current until you reach about 0 0.7. Which means as you increase the voltage, once the voltage is below 0 0.7, it means that that barrier, that potential barrier that was created, which is this, this is where the 0 0.7 is. It means that that barrier has not yet been overcome. So the, the, the PN junction is not conducting. But once, but once you get to 0 0.7 above, that barrier is broken, and then you see the current rises sharply. It means that it's beginning to conduct. Now, when you reverse bias it, as you can see, as you are going backwards, no current is flowing. No current is flowing because it's reverse bias. But of course, everything has a breakdown point. So once you have reverse bias it, and you keep increasing the voltage in reverse, in reverse, it gets to a time that that will break down. And begins to conduct even in the reverse direction 
Once a dial, the normal dial begins to conduct in reverse direction, you have damaged it. It's broken down. Now, whether, whether you, you change it to forward bias or reverse bias, it will be conducted. You have damaged it. Okay. So, just, just to explain this graph as you see here. Now, this is actually how a physical diode looks like. And then, this is a, a schematic symbol. Mm -hmm. So, the arrow shows you that current, it conducts in, one, in, in this direction. Now, the forward bias and reverse bias that we are speaking about gives you, tells you that this PN junction conducts in only one direction. If you apply voltage to it in the in forward bias, it conducts. But when you change the direction, it will not conduct. So if you change the polarity, it will not conduct. So it means that the diode can actually conduct in only one direction. And this arrow tells you that this diode can conduct in, in this direction only. And as you can see, there's a bar here that tells you that it cannot come backwards. If you reverse bias it, it will not conduct. And then another way to show it is this. This line here actually is the same bar here. Yeah? So without this line, you never know whether this is the anode or this is the cathode. As you can see, this is the anode, this is the cathode. The anode is more positive, the cathode is more negative. If you apply positive, uh, positive charge here, uh, positive voltage here, it will conduct. But if you change it, if you apply positive here, it will not conduct. So usually since in the physical diagram, you will not see the arrow with the bar, you usually put this ring there. To let you know that the ring represents this bar you can see so that tells you that this is the anode this is the cathode so if you want to foil bias this physical that you apply the positive here and negative here to conduct if you change it it will not conduct we have different different types of diodes and um, I've, i have some write-up on them all of them here you can i mean you can go through them on your own and then everything is self-explanatory you can go through them on your own and then read them so for the sake of time, we are not going to go through each and every one of them uh, since it, it, uh, they are, the applications have already been spelled out. So please make sure you spend time to go over them. And then um, later on, if you have some questions, you can always get in touch. So these are the uh, symbols of the various uh, common types of dials that we have. Okay, so this brings us to the end of part one of our lectures lecture lectures in electronics one uh, in part two we are going to start looking at the application of the diode yes all these things that we have done mm, all these things that we have done all these things that we have done here mm, forward bias reverse bias creating the pn junction and all that doping and all that where are we getting okay we have created a pn junction is that it i will just i will just create pn junction because we want to we want to show what we can do no at the end of the day, we want to see how we can apply our PN junction or the diode. So, in the, in the part two of the lectures, we will actually be looking at the application of the diode, and it's very, very interesting. So, having said that, um, I will say for now that uh, this is what we have to do for now, and then to be continued with part two. So, this video is only part one. Uh, watch out for part two. Thank you very much, and see you in part two of these lectures. Thank you very much for your time and God bless you.